truth from today is still much longer than that. He has been campus minister for 33 years. And I'm very sorry. And you know, some people call Patrick Mahomes Superman. I call David Duker Superman. <laughs> City Council. Uh, city government for how many years? 17. 17 years. He's running for Dolphin School Board now. He teaches. He's taught at Southern. He teaches at Missouri Southern. Uh, gosh, I can't think of all the other things he does. Mm. And Corner Mia has grown immensely under his leadership. Many of you may know the last few years, we now have a building that serves we have built five houses and starting the sixth, is that right, David? And these, of course, house college students. And uh, this has worked out quite well, and I uh, give David credit for that. So uh, I guess I've said enough, right, David? <laughs> okay, so here's Superman. <laughs> Sometimes I feel like I've hit kryptonite, so it's uh, that way. Behind me, I wanted to go with a few pictures of just showing you what we're doing. Uh, in August, uh, I'm sorry, October 15th of uh, 2020, I believe it was, the building behind us we acquired from College View Baptist Church. It was four acres of land in the building, and we've put quite a bit of work into it since it was a building built in the mid-70s, and uh, we're very thankful to have that. College View sold us prior to that four acres where we have the capacity to build a student center and six houses, and we currently have uh, five houses up with the six ones started all full, and uh, we could have filled three or four more of them this year if we'd had them. So the next slide will show you uh, students on campus. This was taken last uh, August, uh, welcoming new uh, freshmen. The next picture is uh, our meal, and I believe Fur Road is going to be serving the meal to us a week from Thursday, and uh, we had one of our biggest attendances in 15 years two weeks ago. The, the snow shut us down Thursday. We had 67, and I'm hoping that we can grow from there, but uh, this was a picture taken in November, and so these are the people that if you're helping with that meal that benefit from that. The next slide is a picture of three of our houses. This was an empty field when we put it in. Algar Martin did the engineering for us, and uh, we got to pay to put the road in, the curb, the guttering, the housing, and everything, so the sewer, the water, the infrastructure, so it's a, a big project. But to have go in five years from nothing to eight acres of land, a building, and six houses, uh, truly a blessing from the Lord. So if I'm a superman, it's only because of the Lord. When I am weak, he is strong, and that is proven out to be. I, don't, I think that's the last slide that we have. Let's go to the next one, please. I wanted to talk to you today about spiritual eyesight. I serve also, uh, I actually, uh, <clears throat> funny story to get the building, we knew that building might be coming our way, but we didn't have the $1,500 a month to make the payments. And so there were two accounting positions. I have an MBA in accounting. In fact, I taught finance once, and Greg was in my class, and a great student, and had a, a wonderful time with that. But um, interviewed for a position at Pittsburgh State University teaching managerial accounting and cost accounting, and uh, this is my second year doing that. And so we were able to cut my salary tremendously with Koinonia so we could afford that building, and it's worked out well. And uh, so I'm actually teaching a graduate class as well in a, in a financial strategy and uh, been wonderful. Somebody said, what's the difference between Pittsburgh State and Missouri Southern? Well, there's a lot of them, but if you put students in the room, they're from our area and they've got big hearts and they're wonderful and I'm excited about our future. This text tonight, today, this morning that we're going to teach was actually given to me by Mark Scott. I serve at Park Plaza Christian Church. My father was a minister and I came and then B.A. who founded Quinonia followed dad back in 2007 and so three weeks from today I'm preaching this sermon at Park Plaza and uh, this was a topic that was assigned and when I first got it I thought it's like four verses Mark what am I going to do with that and we'll figure it out well as I dug into this spiritual site wow is there a lot of material I want to read the text with you here tonight as we read into our text and they came into Bethsaida and some people brought him a blind man and begged him to touch him and he took the blind man by the hand and led him out of the village. And when he had spit on his eyes and laid his hands on him, he asked him, Do you see anything? 
And he looked up and he said, I see people, but they look like trees walking. Then Jesus laid his hands on his eyes again, and he opened his eyes, and his sight was restored. And he saw everything clearly. And he sent him home, saying, do not even enter the village. Go home, but don't tell anybody. That is our text today. I wanted to look at three different aspects of our text as we study through this morning in the next slide. The first is the question, do you see anything? You know, it's interesting, oftentimes in our lives we have this eyesight that we can see, and yet we're so blind at times. It's interesting in this text that sometimes we don't see things alike, especially when it comes to sports and other things. I was talking to a New York Giants fan. Uh, I won't talk about the Chiefs. We're still healing from that. Um, but a New York Giants fan was talking. He said, you know, it's weird that for over 50 years or so, no team in the Super Bowl ever played in their home field. And last year, Tampa Bay did that. And this year, um, this year, the Los Angeles Rams are going to get to play in their stadium for the Super Bowl. And this guy, the Giants fan, said, well, I've got a solution to that to keep it fair that nobody ever gets home field advantage again. And I said, what's that? He said, play all the remaining games in the Dallas Cowboys stadium and you'll never have that problem again. <laughs> And the Cowboys fan in the room did like some of you, or, whoa, ho, oh, we don't agree on that at all. Sometimes we don't see things alike, especially when it comes to sports and athletics as well as, as many other things. We can see that this man came to Jesus. Let me give you a little bit of the story. This is up by the Sea of Galilee. The Jordan River comes in from the north, from the mountains. Jesus was retreating from the feeding of the 5,000. Often when he tried to get away, people would come to him, bring somebody to be healed, and they brought this blind man. We don't know much about the faith of this blind man, but we know quite a bit about the faith of the people. They brought him to Jesus, believing that he could be healed. And so on this eastern side of the top of the Sea of Galilee, not too far from where Christ had multiplied the loaves and fed the thousands, it's interesting how Jesus can use lowly fishermen, even a child, to convert enough food to feed thousands. You know, when it comes to seeing light, I was a photographer, actually started that in high school, but through 1982, probably about 2015, you may have heard of Weaver Photography. I don't take many pictures today. We've kind of moved on past that. But the biggest challenge uh, when this came out was everybody's a photographer with one of these in their pocket. And somebody said, did the digital age run you out of business? I said, not really, but I will tell you there's a difference between being a photographer and taking pictures. And the biggest difference is the ability to see light, and you just can't teach that very quick. Now, it's better today because you can see instantly, but you know the fascination of the human eye. David Menton, who was the head of molecular biology up at Washington University and was the head into the entrance of the medical school, he did two presentations that he presented at Ozark uh, during some of the things on the human eye and the feather of a bird that led him to conclude only creation could have caused these. But once I learned to see light, and that took about an hour, I have to see how it molds and paints two-dimensional into three-dimensional. There are times that I'm just an eye, I wake up and I see the lighting, and I'm, I'm blown away by that. And I say to everybody in the car, do you see that? And they're like, what? Oh, that's magnificent. Well, once I explain it to them, they kind of see it, and they look at it and shake their heads like, dad's nuts, or he doesn't know what he's talking about. But the ability to see light, and I would say, friends, the spiritual eyesight that Jesus is talking about today is something that is uh, so neat. It's interesting, this healing of the death, uh, the healing of the death mute took place in Mark chapter 7, just a chapter earlier in this. <clears throat> and the man receiving his light, both are recorded by only Mark in the Synoptic Gospels. Both take place in a period of retreat. Both men are taken aside. Jesus uses the spit from his mouth and the touch with both of these. And Jesus tries to avoid attracting attention to himself. We're just on the stage where it's not going to be long until he starts to turn towards the cross, heading down south to Jerusalem. And he says to the man, after he touches his eyes the first time, do you see anything? Do you see anything? I'm going to go back one slide here. You remember when Jesus was born? What was it the shepherds saw? The shepherds saw the angels, a heavenly host, and they were scared to death. I think I would be scared if that happened to me. Out minding my own business in the middle of the night, light. I, I can't imagine how bright that was. What did the wise men see? And as I studied through the scriptures for this text, it just dawned on me how many times the eyes were used in the message of salvation. 
And even when Jesus was born, the sight of angels and the sight of a star was the very beginning of his ministry. But it was long before that that Jesus came. It says in John 1 that he, in the word, he was with God in the beginning. In the beginning was the Word. He was there when the world was created. And we're studying through Genesis and Koinonia this year. And one of the fascinating things somebody said is, if you, one of our speakers said, if you can't believe in the creation of the world, or if you can believe in the creation of the world, then all the other miracles, including rising from the dead, are much easier to believe. If the Lord could create the human eye and everything that we see by His voice, and He gave us the beauty in so many ways to look at, but then in 1 Corinthians chapter 4, Paul says regarding spiritual darkness, he said, The God of this age has blinded the minds of the unbelievers so that they cannot see the light of the gospel that displays the glory of Christ in the image of God. It's fascinating how much people don't want to see or they can't see spiritual things happening right in front of them. It's interesting Jesus, when he was healing the blind man, they lowered a man through the roof. They cut a hole in the roof. That must have made the homeowner happy. They lowered him down through the roof, and there he's laying. His friends must have had exceeding faith to get there. And here is a paralyzed man. What does he want? Well, his friends want him to be healed. We want him to walk again. And so Jesus looks at this man who is paralyzed or can't walk, whatever situation does, and he says, get up and walk, doesn't he? Well, not quite yet. You see, Jesus looked at the man and everybody around saw that his problem was his physical condition. But Jesus saw that his real problem was his spiritual condition. And the very first thing Jesus did to address this man's needs was he said, your sins are forgiven. Oh, that made the Pharisees just thrilled. <laughs> because there's only one person that can forgive sins. And Jesus must have said, that's my point. But that you may believe rise up and walk and immediately the man stood up and walked as if he'd never been physically ill you see the vision of jesus is 2020 and yet the pharisees continued to not see it because of what paul said in first corinthians 4 they cannot see the light of the gospel because the lord has blinded the minds of the unbeliever john chapter 12 talks about blinding eyes he said even after jesus had performed many signs in the presence of the leaders they still would not believe in him and john records in john 12 this was to fulfill what the prophet isaiah said lord who has believed our message and whom has the arm been revealed and then in verse 40 of this passage of isaiah he has blinded their eyes and hardened their heart then in john 12 verse 44 jesus cried out whoever believes in me Whoever believes in me or does not believe in me only, but the one who sent me. Whoever believes in me does not believe in just me, but they believe in the one who sent me, referring to God. I have come into the world as what? As a light. What does light do to our ability to see? So that nobody who believes in me should stay in the darkness. John's quoting this very familiar passage to us in Isaiah chapter 6. Perhaps you've heard it before. May I share that with you for just a moment? Isaiah is seeing a vision. He has been commissioned. The year that King Uzziah died, Isaiah chapter 6 says, I saw, seeing is, I saw the Lord high and exalted, seating on a throne, and the train of his robe filled the temple. And above him were the seraphim, each was six. Do you see what he's describing? Isaiah is in the presence of God and he's trying with human words to describe what his eyes see, but he just can't quite find the words and he does the best that he can. And he hears them crying out, holy, holy, holy is the Lord our God Almighty. The whole earth is full of his glory. And I love the people that say, well, when I see God, I'd like to tell him a thing or two or, you know, God's, you know, it's almost like God's, the only time we pray to him is when we ask him something. And sometimes we're mad at God because, well, I, I see God, I'm going to tell him a thing or two. When you see God, you're going to fall on your face. And you're going to be scared to death. Well, Isaiah was, hey, God, how are you doing? <laughs> no, that's not what Isaiah 6 says. And the sound of their voices crying, holy, 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 Isaiah goes on. The voices at the doorposts and throats, they shook and the temple was full of smoke. 
And Isaiah was like, cool. No, that's not what Isaiah said. Isaiah said this. He said this in Isaiah verse 6, verse 5. Woe to me, I cried out. I am ruined, for I'm a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips, and my eyes have seen the King, the Lord God Almighty. Philippians 2 says that at the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow and every tongue confess. And we see him face to face. The only thing we can do is to realize our unholiness and how unclean we are. And Isaiah describes with his spiritual sight, I can see Jesus. And then he heard the voice of the Lord saying, who shall I send and who will go for us? And Isaiah said, I hear I am, send me. And he said, go tell the people. Why? Because of this, be ever hearing, but they never understood be ever seeing, but never perceiving. Make the heart of his people's callous, their ears dull, and close their eyes that they might see with their eyes and hear with their ears and understand with their hearts and turn to be healed. First point is, do you see anything? Next point I want to talk about is I see trees walking around. Mark Scott in his book said it's interesting. Mark Moore, I'm sorry, wrong Mark. Mark Moore said it's interesting he describes trees. He suggested that maybe this man was not born blind, but perhaps he'd had a sight at some point. Otherwise, how would he know what he was seeing? He saw trees that were perhaps blurry. I found a picture behind me. Those look like blurry trees to me. It's the best that I could come up with. But the interesting thing in this text, he says back to our text today, Mark 8, 14, he looked up and said, I see people, and they look like trees walking around. This is the only two-step miracle that Jesus ever performed. Perhaps he was moving only as quickly as a man's faith would allow. Perhaps he was slowing down to let the people take in what was happening. Perhaps he was just illustrating his sovereignty or his freedom to act as he pleased. Interestingly, using spit aligns with the common Jewish belief in the healing process of saliva. And the fact that the man sees as if there were walking trees around may indicate that he'd had his sight. We had this snowstorm. This was Little Flakes. I remember when I was a sophomore at Ozark Christian College, we were needed to go up to see my family north of Columbus, Ohio. Only a snowstorm was coming up much worse than one we had. And so a gentleman, you may, uh, uh, a gentleman let us use his car, and we drove that car, and we went uh, driving all the way up on the front edge of that snowstorm. We only stopped to quickly use the bathroom, get gas in the car, because we knew to stop would allow that storm to get in front of us and make the snow deeper. And we drove through the entire night to get there. And the only thing that I could do is look for the red headlight, red taillights on a semi-truck in front of me and follow that and pray that they were on the road and pray that they knew where to go, because I couldn't see. And I'd turn on the bright lights, and it'd be even worse. You've turned on brights in a snowstorm, it just you can't see a thing. And somehow the Lord kept his hands on us. I was driving with a young man from Haiti named Roro. Maybe some of you remember him. And uh, Roro at one point, I think, stuck his hand on the steering wheel in St. Louis and pulled it because I was sliding towards a truck. And I about did a 360. And I'm like, Roro, don't ever do that again. <laughs> and somehow the Lord got us there. You've been in situations where you just couldn't see, perhaps in a snowstorm or some other type of storm. May I talk to you about the story in Matthew chapter 14? It was storming. They'd been up feeding. The disciples got in the boat, the Sea of Galilee. Somebody asked a person that lived on the Sea of Galilee, have you ever been in the storm in the Sea of Galilee? Because the mountain to the north, when that cold air comes back, we know what that's like. We get severe storms. Can you imagine one of the worst thunderstorms we've had being in a boat in the middle of the lake? In the midst of this, they see somebody walking across the water, and they're scared to death. If the storm's not bad, and these are seasoned fishermen, by the way. And then they look up, and they see Jesus. And Peter asks, Lord, can I come out of the boat? Matthew records this story. They saw him walk out of the water, and they were terrified, Matthew says. It's a ghost, they cried out in fear. But Jesus immediately said to them, take courage, it is I. Don't be afraid, said the Lord in Matthew 14. Peter replied, Lord, if it's you, then tell me to come to you on the water. Jesus said, come on. Then Peter got out of the boat and walked on the water and came towards Jesus. But verse 30 says something about Peter's sight. But when he saw the wind, he was afraid and began to sink. And he cried out, Lord, save me. 
And immediately Jesus reached out his hand and caught him and said, Ye of little faith, why did you doubt? And when they climbed back into the boat, the winds died down, and those in the boat who worshipped him said, Truly you are the Son of God. Perhaps you're like the blind man that could see blurry trees walking around. You're in the midst of having spiritual discernment, spiritual insight, but you're just not there yet. But don't worry, as you keep on your journey of faith, you'll be able to see clearly, which is my next point, Mark 8, 25. Once, the man, once more, Jesus put his hands on the man's eyes, and his eyes were opened, and his sight was restored, and he saw everything clearly. I was really frustrated back in taking pictures, probably about 15 years ago, the dumb camera, the, the counter that told you which frame you're on back when we had film. Yeah, man, it's been longer. It's been 22 years ago. They got blurry on me. You couldn't see the numbers. I, I sent the camera back. It was under warranty for having blurry numbers, and I didn't do that. You know, that's when I started wearing these. Uh, yeah, and then I started wearing these, and things really fell apart. For those of you that wear glasses, especially, you know what it's like when you don't have your glasses. And yet when we put those on, maybe for the first time we saw the eye doctor and he gave, we didn't realize how bad our eyes were. You remember how clearly we'd seen it. And now after a while we take that for granted. That's what Jesus did for this man. He touched him and the Greek word here indicates it wasn't he could just see. It's that he could see clearly indicating phenomenal sight, the best possible Missouri Southern yesterday, they had an indoor track meet, and they were running the hurdles, and I was saying to, we had a bunch of guys on the corner, well, a bunch of guys and girls, some of the, the best distance runners in the nation are in Koinonia this year, and live, in fact, two of our houses are full of Missouri Southern cross country team, and I was laughing at them, I said, I remember those high hurdles, they said, yeah, they said, I hate those things, I said, yeah, I said, I was successful in the half mile and the mile, but boy, those hurdles, I mean, I kept falling on my face, and we had a cinder track, that hurt. And after I did that a couple times, I took the hurdle on the football foot, it was grass, and I tried, and the hurdle guys, they were laughing. They said, Weaver, you look like a wounded duck going over those. And I was so humiliated and so frustrated, and I came walking over to Donnie Erickson. Donnie Erickson, by the way, that season won the state championship in Washington in the high hurdles, had the state record, may still have it to this day. And I said, all right, Erickson, how do you do it? And he said something I'll never forget. In fact, this was 1981 that he said this, and I'm telling you about it here today. He said, your problem, Weaver, is that when you come to this hurdle, your eyes are focused right on the hurdle, and you start stuttering in your steps. And the reason you hit it every time is because you're so focused on that hurdle that nothing else matters and you fall flat on your face. Easy for you to say, Erickson. How do you do it? Every race I run, there's a string across the finish line. And for the hundred meters of that race, my eyes are focused intently on that string, the finish line, and nothing else. Oh, occasionally I hit a hurdle, but I run through it because I don't focus on the hurdle. I focus on the finish line. Perhaps that's what the writer of Hebrews meant in Hebrews chapter 12 when he said, Fix your eyes on Jesus the author and perfecter of our faith. It's the same thing Jesus told Peter when he sank in the water. You're looking at the wrong things. Fix your eyes on me. And when you do that, he was walking on water. And when you fix your eyes as a track runner on the finish line, you win races. And perhaps the reason we don't have the spiritual discernment to the level that we'd like, the spiritual vision, is because we're not looking to Jesus. We're looking at the things that the world has to offer. And we see blurry trees instead of clearly the way Jesus had intended for us to be all the time. The Samaritan woman at the well. Everybody else saw a woman caught in sin, a woman that had multiple husbands, a woman that was living with a man. In fact, she was so ashamed that she went at a time of the day that nobody would see her there. And she was a Samaritan, and Jesus was a Jew. And when he came to get water, and by the way, he had to go out of his way a little bit to get there, when he went to get the water, she was trying to small talk or get out of this uncomfortable situation. And Jesus asked her for a drink, and the conversation went up, and she said, if you knew it was, it was asking for a drink, you would ask him. 
And she made a statement and said, what you've said is quite true. The fact is that you've had several husbands, and the guy you're living with now is not your husband. And they, she changed the subject to that question that plagues all the churches today. How should we do worship? Yeah, it was back at the woman at well in John chapter 4. But Jesus saw through a sinful woman that society had rejected. And she went back to Samaria where the disciples had been, men who had been following Jesus, walking with him, spending all their time. And she said, come meet the man that told me everything, so much that several of the Samaritans came up to the mountain to meet Jesus. And they believed not only because of what the women said, but because of meeting Jesus themselves. Do you have the ability to see people who need Jesus? To pour into their lives? To be involved in more than just shaking hands and greeting them on Sunday morning and saying, hey, glad you're here. Do you have the spiritual discernment to look at somebody and to, that Lord's just pressing you? I don't know who this person is, but I just feel led to pray for them this morning. Do you have the spiritual eyesight? You see, the touch of the master's hand and the Samaritan woman changed their lives. And then Jesus does the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew chapter 5, where he says this, which is totally contrary to everything that they believe then. Even today, we think the world says this is crazy. And I won't read the whole thing, but perhaps you remember hearing this. Blessed are the poor in sight. There it is, sight again. For theirs is the kingdom of heaven, Matthew 5, 3. Blessed are those who mourn, so they'll be comforted. Blessed are the meek. So they... It was completely backwards all through these Beatitudes. Do you see the world the way Jesus sees the world? Our text this morning said the man's eyes were opened, his sight was restored, and he saw everything clearly. Hebrews 11, verse 3 says, By faith we understand that the word was world was formed by God's command. So what is seen, what we see today was not made out of what is visible. Paul's talking about the jars of clay in 2 Corinthians chapter 7. He says in verse 8, We're hard-pressed on every side, but not crushed, perplexed, but not in despair, persecuted, but not abandoned, struck down, but not destroyed. Therefore, do not lose heart, though outwardly we are wasting away, yet inwardly we are being renewed day by day. For light and momentary troubles, and oh, friends, if we had two years of light and momentary troubles, I'd say not so light troubles. We've been in a pandemic. Mental health is hard right now. Life is hard for so many people. But the momentary troubles are achieving us an eternal glory. So we fix our eyes, this clear sight, we fix our eyes not in what is seen, but what is unseen. Since that what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. I want to close with two stories this morning. The first one is found in 2 Kings chapter 6. Elisha is being pursued by the king of Aram, and the king of Aram finds out they're down in Dotham, and he's looking for them, and they come back and say, they're in Dotham. And he says, great, we've got him now in the middle of the night. All of his chariots and all of the power of this king and his army surround Elisha and his much lesser armies. And they wake up in the morning, they go out as the sun's coming up, and all they can see is the enemy all around them. And the servant comes back. It tells us in 1st, 2nd Kings chapter 6, the servant comes back and says, Oh, man of God, they're surrounded. What shall we do? We're doomed. They're going to rout us. They snuck up on us. Nobody knew they were coming. How are we going to overcome this? And I see Elijah sitting there eating an apple or something. I don't know. He's not worried. Because he doesn't see it the way this guy says. Kind of like Jesus in the midst of a storm walks out and tells us to be quiet. Elisha's sitting there and says, don't be afraid. Those who are with us are more than those who are with them. One, two, three, four, two, two thousand. We have one, two, two hundred. Elijah, I don't think your math's very good. We're outnumbered tremendously here. I see Elijah taking another bite out of his apple or whatever he's eating, swallows, and he says this. He says, Lord, open his eyes so that he may see. And then the Lord opened the servant's eyes, and he looked on the hills. 
All around him there were hills full of horses and chariots of fire. And everywhere you see Elijah had the spiritual insight to see what human eyes couldn't see. The power of God's armies was surrounded and the king was no match for them. And then Elijah prayed this. He said, Lord, strike this army with blindness. And so the Lord struck him with blindness. And Elijah goes up to their camp and is like, um, do you have a problem? <laughs> yeah, we can't see. Well, come, to, come with me. I, I'll take you to the guy you're trying to get. Okay, thanks. And he takes him right back down, right down into the city. And after they entered the city of Samaria, the Lord said, Elijah prayed, okay, open their eyes. And they look up, and now they're surrounded. And Elisha's armies are giddy. They're like, want us to kill them now? <laughs> Elijah says, no. Make a feast. Feed them like they're kings. And they did that. And all the time, I think they're scared to death. Here they got food, but this is a trap. It's like Star Wars. It's a trap. <laughs> After they're done, do you want to kill us now? No, send them home. And it tells us this in 2 Kings chapter 6, verse 23. So the bands from Aram stopped raiding Israel's territory. Behind me, there's a picture of an airplane and a story that goes with it from 1956. It was a day that a 29-year-old man named Jim had waited for most of his life. He jumped out of bed that morning. He was excited that this was the big day that he had been waiting for. Almost three years in jungle ministry and many hours of planning and praying had led him to this day. Within hours, he and four other missionaries would be settling in a camp in the territory of the dangerous and uncivilized Indian tribe known as the Alcas. Known as one of the most uncivilized people known to kill outsiders ever in that area. Even though it was dangerous, Jim had no doubts that God wanted him to tell the Alcas about Jesus. And growing up as a little boy in Portland, Oregon, Jim listened carefully as visiting missionaries talked about faraway mission fields. And he asked them questions and dreamed about being a missionary himself someday. And it made him sad that so many people in other countries died without knowing God. Finally, on day six, two Aka women walked out in the jungle. Jim's plane had landed exactly where they were and the river, and he waited over them, excited to meet them. But as he got closer, the women did not appear friendly. In fact, Jim and Pete almost immediately heard the terrifying cries behind him as the Aka warriors. And as they turned, their spears were raised, and they knew this didn't look good. And ready to throw them, Jim reached for his sidearm. But then he remembered the vow he'd made to the Lord, I will not use my gun to kill those who I came to minister to, even if it cost me my life. The Alka warriors threw their spears, killing all the missionaries, Jim Elliott and his four cohorts. But don't think the Operation Alka ended there because it didn't. In less than two years, Elizabeth Elliott's Jim's wife and his daughter, Valerie, and Nate's sister were able to move to the Alka village. And many Alkas became Christians. And they are now friendly because of the resurrection and the power of the Holy Spirit. Because Jim Elliott had the vision to see what nobody else could. A tribe that needed Jesus. Missionaries including Nate's son and family are still living among the Alkas today. As Elizabeth Elliott even helped make a movie about Operation Alka called Through the Gates splendor it showed real life scenes of the five missionaries and the beach in which they were killed and Jim closed with this statement he is no fool he gives up what he cannot keep to gain what he could not lose John records in Revelation 21 then I saw a new heaven and a new earth for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away and there was no longer any sea and I saw the holy city and the new Jerusalem Look, God's dwelling place is now amongst his people, and he will dwell with them. And he will be, they will be his people, and God will be their God. And he will wipe every tear from their eyes, and there will be no more death and no mourning or crying from pain. For the old order of things have passed away. You see, friends, to have spiritual 20-20 eyesight, it takes a touch from Jesus.
How are you doing today in your walk with the Lord? Do you see people as Jesus sees them? Do you see opportunities that Jesus puts in front of you? Do you see the struggles of your life today being temporary? Because as Paul said, what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. Would you bow with me as we head into our invitation hymn? Our Heavenly Father, we are thankful for the spiritual discernment, for the eyesight that so many, the heroes of the faith, had in Hebrews 11. Father, we're thankful for the ministry and the way that Jesus taught not only his disciples, but all of us even today. We're thankful for the ministry of Jim Elliott, Father, who in the midst of sure death pursued you and pursued the vision that you'd given him to make a difference in far more lives than he ever could have had things turned out differently that day. Lord, if there be one here today that needs to see you as their Lord and Savior, would today be the day that you open their eyes and that they would come as we sing. In Jesus' name, amen.